Welcome to Nonprofit Nerd Impact Unleashed. Get ready to dive into the world of nonprofits, where the nerdy passion and unstoppable dedication of those making a real impact is celebrated. Together with your host, Jarrett Ransom, the inspiring stories and game changing strategies of nonprofit leaders will be explored. Join us to unravel the mysteries of successful fundraising, uncover the secrets to effective advocacy, and nerd out over innovative approaches to solving social challenges. Nonprofit Nerd Impact Unleashed is your go to podcast for no nonsense discussions with real life superheroes of the nonprofit sector. Get ready to unleash your inner nerdiness and discover or rediscover how to change the world together. Now let's dive in and embrace the power of our nerdy side. Have a listen to this conversation. It was another fun-filled conversation that I get to have. This one is with Pearl Hoagland. She is with Fundraising Academy at National University. Also, thank you for being this season's sponsor. We are so glad to have Fundraising Academy support and National University support in these conversations. So go ahead and listen because Pearl's got some great information to share with you. Plus, she shares a little bit about her love for latte art. Take a listen. Hey, Pearl, how are you? Hey, Jared, I'm great. How are you doing? Well, I am so excited to have this conversation with you. Uh, first of all, thank you, because Fundraising Academy at National University is this season's sponsor, and I am so thrilled. And when I wanted you know, to have a conversation with someone from F.A., I knew it had to be you, Pearl. So welcome. I'm glad that you're here and willing to dive deep <laughs> from this authentic space. I love it. I'm so happy to be here as representing Fundraising Academy. So happy to be the sponsor for this year, to be a part of the Nonprofit Nerd Podcast. And then personally, I just, I love the work you do. So I'm happy to be to be presenting and um, share a little bit about Fundraising Academy myself and just be a part of this. Well, let's dive in. And, you know, as I've shared with all of my guests and our listeners know, like this is a real conversation, real talk, authentic space. Um, and I always say you get to write your own script. You get to choose what you share with us. But let's start off with the names you go by. And I realize there's so many titles in this world. There's so many titles that actually go, you know, um, behind our signature and our business card, things like that. But what are some of the names that you go by and, um, yeah, the roles that you play? So I feel like I have so many <laughs> names, just like so many people, because your personal and professional can sometimes get a little um, blended. But I would say the, the ones that jump out to me that I would say I um, am most do the most, right? That I, that I most often do are mom. I'm a mom to two girls. Um, I'm a partner. I have my spouse, a friend. And I like to think of myself as a friend, both personally and professionally, um, a colleague, a manager, a leader, and then daughter, granddaughter, and sister when, when that happens too. <laughs> That is a lot of titles. Yeah. And yeah. we talk about that a lot in the nonprofit world, but I think it's probably so many worlds, right? It's like, we do so much within that 24 hour time span. You mm -hmm. said something about this, this blend, right? Where it's like, you know, the personal, the professional, it's a little bit of, of, of a mix. How does that show up for you? Like, like, I'm just curious, what does that look like for you? And do you turn a switch on and off? Like when you go to work and when you go home? What does that look like? I only turn on the wake up, so <laughs> the wake up switch. I think I'd like to think that I'm pretty much myself, both personally and professionally. Um, it's important to me that my colleagues and team feel connected to me and feel that I am being authentic. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's bad. You know, when I'm having a bad day, I try to own it and try to recognize that and not put that on others. But um, so I would say, yeah, it's. I turn on the switch to be present. And then I, what I try to do is manage that switch so that I can continue to be present at home. Cause as a mom or as any, as a caregiver or parent, your second job starts when your first job ends. So how that I would say is that the biggest challenge of being present enough to be impactful and, and supportive while preserving yourself enough to be able to do that at home too, for those who need you maybe even more. 
Yeah, that is so profound. And I, I could go in a, a couple of different ways, but I'd love to lean into how you maintain being present. Mm -hmm. I'm guilty for myself, finding myself, getting into autopilot, just doing the next thing because it's what I've always done. How do you maintain that presence? Well, I'll be honest. It's a hard question to answer because I am a full on people pleaser and I'm lucky that the job I do, I genuinely care about. I care about the people. I care about the work. So if I didn't manage myself, I would absolutely not do that. Um, you know, I would say when COVID hit, it was a big realization for me. Suddenly I had a three-year-old at home and I couldn't work in the way that I had before. I had to manage expectations. And I was lucky that I worked for an organization and had an amazing boss who basically said, you tell me what that balance looks like and, and really supported that so I could be successful. But so, so to answer your question now, um, honestly, it's having to remind myself throughout the day and, and genuinely having to think about when I look back on this in any moment, will this be as important to me as it is right now? And that definitely helps me prioritize and, and shift things around, but also just being very vocal about that with the people around me. So with my older daughter, I have had to tell her, you know, when we had it, we do have bad days. I'm exhausted. I'm impatient and feeling terrible that I didn't save the best of me for them. And so I've, I've told her, you know, I had a bad day today and I'm, and that is not on you and you're going to have bad days and you can take it out on me but it's not my job to take that out on you. And I'm sorry. And I think it's helped because she's hopefully seeing me work through it and learn how to balance. Cause I'll be honest, it's not, it doesn't come naturally to me. Yeah. That was so beautiful. Also, I, you know, and I, I want to add some levity to this in regards to your Instagram. I've been following you and you are making some beautiful latte art. Is that your wake up call? Is that you're like, I've got to get caffeinated. This means I'm on and I have to be present because you're getting really good at that latte art. Oh my gosh. I'm actually still terrible. I think the ones I've posted are my lucky ones, but man, it is hard. First of all. So it is absolutely my form of self-care except my husband likes iced and I really want him to like hot so I can make two a day. <laughs> but yes, the thing about for me, latte foam art, I know it's becoming a thing and I'm totally jumping on a trend. Um, it takes so much precision and it just so much focus and a different kind of research. And I don't know, there's something about it that my daughter is my biggest fan. She watches me do it. She celebrates it, even if it's horrible, but I feel like it's something that I can fully control and I can decide to stop doing it, but it's just mine. And it's really, it's really fun. <laughs> I've been enjoying it. And if those are your best, I can, I would love to see what does it make the Instagram. Oh yeah. <laughs> I have an album. <laughs> That would be amazing to see. Ironically, I was watching one of the things about me, and I don't know how many of our listeners know this, Pearl. I love survival shows, right? Naked and Afraid, Alone, Survivor. And I think there's a tie into the nonprofit world about what can we do with so very little? I think it also goes back to, I grew up watching MacGyver, right? Like after school special. Okay, we've got a straw, duct tape, and a paper clip. Go, what can you make? But through watching Alone last night, there was one contestant, because it is a game, and she maintained her sanity by staying busy. And what you're you're saying about this latte art, like you're pouring, pun intended, you're pouring everything into that moment. Mm -hmm. She was pouring everything into this game by making mm -hmm. baskets or spears or something else, right? Like maintaining her presence in her 24 hour time allotment. Yeah. Um, and you, again, you wear so many hats. You also just earned your MBA. Is that right? Because that's not did. too long ago. So how, yeah. how the heck did you manage higher education, more letters behind your name while also working full time, leading and managing a team you know, having a partner, having children, all of this, how did you do all that? And man, it doesn't, it honestly doesn't feel real. First thing, having a partner and in, in the truest sense of the form that my partner is, is my, you know, we are 
uh, we are partners in life and in parenting and um, what may still seem unconventional is in our world very conventional that there's no there are no rules that we each share we're, we're we're fully committed so he had to commit just as much as I did to parenting our children in a way that where I needed him to step in so first of all I do work at National University and being a staff member there one of the benefits is to be able to achieve my MBA um, so that first of all without that, I wouldn't have been able to do that, which is incredible. It was asynchronous facilitated, which means it essentially the whole program was set up so that a working adult could actually achieve it. Now it was really hard work. And let's be honest, I didn't, I think I had two free nights that entire time. Um, I did the accelerated. So I did it in about 14 months. So essentially what I did was where I really thrive is checklists and, um, basically managing my time and managing the things that I need to get done so that I know where I have free time. So that's what I did every single day. I knew what I had to do that week. My kids knew what I was doing. I didn't hide the ch- how hard it was. And I started my, my schoolwork at about nine to 10 PM every single night and went to bed at about 2 AM. And wow. I knew it was finite. So I knew I could do it. And I knew if I didn't have to, I was choosing it and I wanted my kids to see it. I really wanted them to see that I could do it and that if that basically they could do anything they wanted. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be done, but it also had a leadership concentration. So I'm using it every day and, and yeah, I'm really happy I did it, but man, I, I'm good to go now. <laughs> with education. Talk about, yeah. Burning it, you know, burning the candle at both <laughs> ends. You're right. Like having that partner I can imagine was so very helpful. Um, What about additional like professional commitments, personal commitments? Now that you're done with your MBA, you've earned that degree, those letters are behind your name. What does this blend and like, how are you handling the two, I'm going to say like two different areas, but as we've already shared, they're very much like Mm -hmm. they come together. Um, How do you handle now removing that big time suck of the MBA? You know, what's weird. Okay. This is so such a weird comparison, but you know, when they say, when you make more money, it balances out. And then you don't feel like you're making more money. Have you ever heard that expression? It's kind of when you suddenly have all of this free time, like, wait a minute, when did I have time to do this? I don't feel like I have all this free time, but somehow I, I managed to do that. So to be honest, I think, I think I'm still recovering. Um, physically I'm still recovering. So I'm giving myself some grace and I'm, I'm not doing a lot of, we're not committing to a lot, but what I'm doing this year is focusing on health. So I'm trying to find, to maintain perspective and find those short periods throughout the day to get some sunlight, to get moving, even if it's for 20 minutes, just to build literally pun intended, that muscle memory of getting out and focusing on me and making sure I'm going to be here for a long time. So it's funny. I I don't feel like I have all this free time now and probably because now I'm sleeping (laughs) during that time, but, but still it's, it's really interesting when you think about how, you know, what it's like to carve out that time for yourself when it felt like we didn't have it before. I do have it. I just need to be intentional about it. That's a very keen awareness. And I have heard that when it comes to money, like when you make Mm -hmm. more, you spend more Mm -hmm. and to have that analogy connected with time, when you have more, you probably do more, you fill it with more. Um, You speak so fondly of your two amazing children. How are they showing up and maybe even like being in this space now, mom has more time. I know one of them, you know, is the biggest fan of your latte art, although we might be in close ties there, (laughs) but I do wish I lived closer because you could make me a hot latte anytime. I would love to take that up. Um, but yeah, what, what do you do for fun with your kids? What does that look like? Well, first of all, I'd make you a coffee every day. If you live close. (laughs) Um, so with my kids, they're seven and three, they're both girls and full of life. So what do I do to have fun? My, they both love nature. Um, my older daughter loves science, biology. She's just really interested in how the world works. So we have been kind of letting them lead. So we'll go on walks and they built this massive stick fort that you could literally go in and close the door. And it's just really 
it's fun. So honestly, exploring with them, um, just you know, go, right now it's spring break in San Diego. So we're trying to avoid the really high, crazy, chaotic places, but we live in a beautiful place where we can literally walk out the door and, and go for a hike. So exploring with them, just trying to spend real quality time. That's not dedicated or not, you know, connected to our phones, just really uh, looking them in the eyes and listening to what they're saying, writing songs together. It just, yeah, we try to spend a lot of actual time together. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of fun. I'm going to flip the script and ask about how you show up, especially going through your degree, the leadership track, managing a team. How do you show up in this authentic space, model this for your staff, encourage the same from your staff? Could you talk to us about like, what does that I don't know, like the culture of your team, Uh, again, fundraising Academy at national university, like you're in San Diego, it's beautiful. What does that team environment look like for you when you show up in your authentic space? So full transparency, I'm sure that what I feel about the team, you know, probably get six different answers uh, from our team members. But so what I care most about when it comes to my team is knowing who they are as individuals recognizing that everyone has a different way of working, different responses, different triggers, lived experiences. And and that's what makes our team so beautiful and what makes our collaboration just so much richer, Uh, but that also requires a different approach for every single person. So first, I really do try to show up as myself. Sometimes I might overshare about what I'm experiencing at home if I'm having a really hard day or kids are having a hard day, but that's because I want them to know that they can do the same. Also, I try to make sure I'm comfortable or I make them comfortable. So, you know, if that's not comfortable for them, I will, I will absolutely adjust that. But I do feel like if you see your manager not setting those boundaries for themselves, then they're going to expect you to do the same. And I never want to be that person because ultimately those who are healthier, happier, feel like they can take care of their families will be more connected to your organization, the work you do and, and, the relationships will actually be based on trust and and real uh, authenticity. So that's what I try to do. Well, I see you model it, you know, and I love when I see I'm taking the day off. It's a personal care day or wellness day. And I know that you do this with your team as well. And you encourage them to do the same, but I've got to say, you know, really knowing who they are as an individual speaks Mm -hmm. volumes. And I, where did you learn that? Like, is that just something you were born with, ingrained in you? Was it something you learned in your leadership track? Like that just seems to come so natural to you. So, well, thank you. I would say my family is that way a hundred percent. I, um, but also that has been modeled to me by my, especially recent, um, supervisors who just lived that as well and encouraged me to do that. And frankly, coached me in being a leader, um, and being an authentic leader, which I, which I hope I do. So yeah, I, I'd really, it being modeled for me and my team too. I mean, they are incredibly transparent and communicative and, and that also helps in a way, keep me in line and help me maintain perspective that like how they're responding to me. I feel like I'm not the same person I was even just a few months ago because of them. So they're definitely teaching me a lot and helping me really try to be the best manager for them. And, and, you know, who knows if you'll ever get there, but I hard. <laughs> <laughs> and what about burnout? That is huge in our sector. Um, really focusing on managing our well-being, self-care, relaxation. What are some things you do to prevent burnout? And I'm going to say really maintain a level of balance, you know, that blend of, of things that you do to take care of yourself. What are those things besides exploring in nature and making really cool stick forts with your children? That sounds fun. <laughs> I think they might be on a loan at some point, right? That, that yes. our show. <laughs> they will be. And by the way, I did not contribute to the stick fort. I just want to say that was all my husband. Um, I He is the engineer by at heart. You know, I wish I could have supported that. I am, I'm, I, to be honest, I'm not the best example. Um but what I will say is for me, the way to prevent burnout is to make sure I still love what I'm doing and finding that balance between taking care of myself, but also being there for my team so they can take care of themselves. 
that's a really hard balance to find. And, yeah. and I, I would say I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm trying to navigate that. Ultimately, I know that if something happens, I know every single person on the team will want to do whatever it takes to support. And that's not always a good thing uh, for, for preventing burnout and managing wellness. But I do think that that shared reliability is so important. So for me, still navigating that, but coming back to, is it a big problem? Is it a little problem? What's the outcome here of, but what are the different scenarios? What can I live with? And what, what can I deal with? What are the things that I can give up to ultimately preserve myself, my team, my life, my kids, that balance. And it's, it's hard. It's not easy. And there's a lot of privilege in me saying that because not everyone can make those decisions. And, and I want to recognize that it's, it's very different for, um, for different experiences and different scenarios. Yeah. Thank you for that. All of that. Yeah, I, I too know that I speak from a place of privilege and earlier in um, maybe this season or last season, you know, I talked about having the ability and the flexibility in my schedule to drop my son off at school, pick him up from work, go to his track meet, right? Like there's so many things that I get to do. Um, mm -hmm. One that hasn't always been the case for me in my career. And I also acknowledge and recognize right alongside with you, Pearl, um, that that's not the privilege everyone has, yeah. um, you know, and, and how can we possibly afford that uh, to, to everyone? I'm really curious. I'm leaning into this expansion mindset. And what that means to me, at least, is to see something maybe done differently. And it expands my mind of possibilities, right? And I initially heard this from kind of going on a side tangent here, uh, one of my close girlfriends, and there was a couple that she just adored and she thought they had the best relationship. She's been single for a long time herself. And she's like, this couple is my expansion mindset couple because they demonstrate and model to me what is possible, right? Like what is out there? So I know I'm totally throwing a curveball, putting you on the spot, but like, is there someone or a practice, a tool, a technique, anything that kind of shows up for you when you're like, that is something I could say was expansion mindset. When I saw it, it really spoke to me. It, it like, you know, kind of lit up my soul, my heart, my eyes, my brain, and was like, I want more of that, or I want to do more of what they're doing. Does that, does that make sense? <laughs> it does. It is a good question. And I'm drawing a blank because that's happened so many times. Yeah. And, you know, I would say, <clears throat> gosh, what was the example? Um, I was meeting with the team, the, the HQ team, we call them. So, so Faith and, and Jesse, and I, I can't even remember the details, but there was something that we were talking about and it's something that we've always done. Mm. And I wish I had more of an explanation, but I actually think it's important to talk about this because it came from, I believe it came from faith. There was some idea of, to do something differently because of where she sits in the organization, she sees it differently. And it was actually, a, it wasn't, you know, we think about this new product or this new philosophy but sometimes the smallest, the smallest ideas, I say that in air quotes because they're not small, can actually transform your way of working and transform the way, like you said, your perspective and the way you look at something. Because sometimes you just have to look at it from another angle and it can completely alter the way in which you work. So I actually think from the team, I get that almost every day because there are always these amazing new ideas if you kind of just get out of your own way and yeah, get out yeah. of everybody's way. Um, so that's actually where I really look for the most magic and transformational impact. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and to have that with your team, um, that that's a gift. And I think like really speaks to, again to that culture, believe it or not, our time is flying by. So I do want to ask you this. You mentioned it's spring break in San Diego. Are you taking a spring break or like, when is your next vacation? What does that look like for you? When are you saying out of office? <laughs> what is yes. <laughs> so no, I'm not, take, I'm not taking spring break, but actually my husband's family is coming from Germany after a few years in April. So we will be spending some time then, but actually I just got back from a trip with my daughter. I took her to DC where I'm from and we got to be kids. I got to see my hometown through her eyes 
here are the most incredible questions that I never thought to ask, you know, that was just like, well, that's just the way it is. Um, go to museums, be with family, and just really be out of the office for, for an extended time. So I'm coming off of vacation, but we will definitely plan something for the summer and then something small for when his family's here. Oh, don't you love seeing things through the eyes of our children? Like that yeah. to me is just so, it could be air quotes again, the smallest or simplest of things. And it's like a whole new perspective on it. It is. And isn't it the most humbling to have to always say, I don't know, to another <laughs> question? <laughs> I don't know yes. why th those museum doors were that big. Yes, you're right. Maybe it was to move in that statue. I mean, it's amazing. And also it feels so discrediting <laughs> to not be able to answer all these questions that are so interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. And I know she'll remember that trip and have so, like such great fond memories. Um, did Were the cherry blossoms in bloom? No, we went shortly before it was for her ski week, which air quotes, cause we're in San Diego. Yeah. Uh, so it was still chilly, which was actually better because my, okay. you know, my little summer kids need some perspective when it comes to weather. <laughs> That's right. Oh, good. Well, this has been such a pleasure, Pearl. Again, uh, Pearl Hoagland, National University. Uh, she's with Fundraising Academy. For everyone listening, where can we find more about Fundraising Academy, what you do, what you offer? Um, because we're a lot of nonprofit nerds listening in here. Yes, absolutely. So you can visit our website, fundraising-academy.org. And essentially what we do is we provide low cost and no cost professional development to help you build better relationships with donors, frankly, stay in this career, avoid burnout, and really love the sector and grow in your profession. So visit our website, visit our completely free online learning portal. Awesome. All right. Well, get that uh, coffee maker ready, espresso maker, whatever it is you call it, because I'm coming over for a latte. That sounds amazing. I can't wait. All right. Thank you, Pearl. This was such an honor. Thank you so much, Jarrett.